wait for that to go up. Uh, and then I will um, let everyone in. So done, click on that and mute it and we're ready to roll. All right, Kurt, you're gonna have to unmute yourself, but uh, um, once we get rolling. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, you can see everybody is slowly but surely logging in. Sorry for the delay. We had some uh, technical difficulties as it were, um, but, uh, oh, you can't hear me? Uh, is Kurt not here? Oh, try now, Kurt. There we go, that's better. Chelsea took away my co-hosting, so I couldn't unmute <laughs> well, myself. I, I didn't know what this was, so I was trying to figure it, figure it out. Okay, well, we've just been bombarded with six minutes of uh, trials and tribulations, but we're, we're alive. We've got seven drams in front of us. Um, the world is our oyster, as it were. Um, but thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, you've got uh, Kurt and Andrew from Kensington Wine Market here to talk whiskey with you. And we've got pretty cool range for tonight's tasting. Um, Kurt's going to fire that into the chat. Um, we might do it a second time just to make sure that uh, everyone can see it. Um, but in addition to that, um, while we're waiting for the last few stragglers um, to tune in, um, just give you guys a quick um, rundown of some of the tastings we have coming up over the next few weeks. And I don't know why that didn't open up properly, but it will. Um, tastings and tasting schedules. So here we go. I'll share my screen. Um, just to kill another couple minutes before we get going. That's where we are tonight. So there's no point in telling you about that, but it's going to be fun. I'm sure I'm sure of it. Uh, single malt or Scotch malt whiskey society, sorry, is coming up on Wednesday, tomorrow. It's coming up tomorrow night. Um, we did add a few seats to that. There are a few leftovers. There are a couple of really cool whiskeys in this month's out turn. I can't say a lot about it other than that. They have festival labels. You might be able to figure out what that is. Um, so well worth, uh, tuning into. It's also going to be Robin Kelly's last out turn before they head back to Scotchland um to deal with their visas so we might not see them in in town for a month or more um bourbon is sold out which is great taylor flagate sold out so sorry you can't do that either but we do have a few tastings with spots available the eau claire vertical single malt tasting coming up in a few weeks time november 19th in addition to batches one through five of the single malt which have never been tasted before at least batch five hasn't been tasted by hardly anybody um, as a special treat, they've pulled a sample from our Kensington Wine Market Eau Claire cask. So participants of the tasting are going to get to be able to try six different single malts, um, which for sure must be a record uh, from Eau Claire. So that's coming up on the 19th. Tickets are very reasonable, 25 bucks. Um, also very reasonable considering there's two greedy angels in it. We've got Amrit with Ashok Chokalingham. Our good friend Ashok will be joining us live from Bangalore, India for a baller range of Indian single malts. Um, Ultimate Boonhaven tasting with our friend, Mike Breezeball. He'll be joining us live from Ontario for that one. Uh, not an inexpensive tasting, but the range is worth like 12 grand, 271 years of Boonhaven, so that's cool. Uh, Kinship sold out. Ah, but then this one, which I'm really excited about. If you've seen the movie, Don't Mess With The Zohan, you might get the joke. These blends are all really smooth. If you haven't seen that movie, you won't get it, but it's, I assure you, it's very clever. I was quite proud of that. Um, very proud these, of with, that. Yeah, very, very proud. <laughs> but these tastings are all coming up. Um, we should have some tastings up for the new year um, in the next week or two, certainly before December. A um, couple of highlights that we already know. There'll be a couple of Gordon McPhail tastings because we have some casts coming. There's going to be an Aaron tasting with a crazy range because we have an Aaron cask landing in the next few weeks. Lots of cool stuff on the horizon and uh, hopefully you'll join us for some of those. Um, quick shout out. I can see again, we've got people from uh, 
British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec um, on with us tonight, probably a few places in between and even beyond, but uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. And I, Kurt. Yeah, I don't see an amazing beard to call out and commend tonight so far. We got a lot of great screens and stuff, but man, look at Cam's flowing locks there. Yeah, he's got some some sweet uh, waves in those hair. That's nice, Cam. We're digging it. Um, yeah, we haven't had Peter Green on a, the tasting for a while, but I think he tamed his beard anyway. So um, I'm also sharing for any of you watching on Facebook, the order of whiskeys is in the chat on Facebook as well, too. So welcome to anybody who's watching there. And on that note, Kurt, do you have any words of wisdom before we dig in or should we just jump right into this and nose and taste some whiskeys? I haven't said anything wise in a lot of years. Actually, I don't even remember the last time I heard something wise. So let's drink some whiskey. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we are jumping right in with Compass Box. Compass Box Menagerie, to be specific. Um, share my screen here for this one so you guys can all see it. Just make sure I have the right one up. There we go. Um, this arrived not too long ago. Um, we did have a bottle open earlier, so I'm pretty sure I've already written a tasting note on it, but uh, we're going to dive into this one fresh tonight. Um, predominantly Mortlick, um, good chunk of a Highland malt blend, which they're always big fans of these mystery Highland malt blends from French Oak, um, some Deanston, some Glenelgan, a little bit of Laphroaig, a little bit more Glenelgan, and then a bit more Deanston as well. And uh, 46%. And Kurt, what are you getting on the nose with this? A lot of happiness, to be honest. Um, the last few Compass Box releases, well, I think you know as well as I do, they don't put out bad whiskey, period. But the last few have been like, oh, okay, there's another decent Compass Box, but nothing special, nothing I felt like I really wanted. This is the first one in probably since Tobias that I actually really want a bottle of. Everybody but, wanted Tobias. Oh, yeah. James has another one everybody's going to want. I, I believe it's another no name. He's already got it, that bastard. Um, well, I'm digging all the he, fruit tones, all the orange tones. To me, I oh, would yeah. never in a million years guess that this was this heavy. Like half of this batting is more back in Lafroy. This is not what I would imagine for that kind of mix. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I think that was kind of the intent behind it was uh, it's a menagerie of beasts, of beastly flavors and aromas um kind of each speaking for themselves and creating something that's you know a beautiful marriage of them but you can try to pick out some of those characteristics and definitely you can pick out that kind of meatiness of the the mortlick you can pick out a little bit of that slight medicinal tinge from the lafroy as well they show up a little bit more on the palate i did slightly sip ahead because i like to have like that retro hail um <laughs> It's not quite as fruity on the palate as you get on the nose, but I'm, I'm blown away by how much orange I'm getting and soft pastry tones and everything. Mm -hmm. There's, there's mm -hmm. as you said, there's that slightly savory kind of aspect to it. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, yeah, this is a surprise to actually know what's in it. The nose has got a nice little like faint waxiness to it too. It's a little floral and some there's some nice fruits on it. I get like a lot of apple, pear, banana, and then starting to move into sort of melons. And I agree with you. There's a, a big juicy hit of orange there too. Taking a little really longer to get to the palate. Palette. You know, it's funny. You're right. Like it's not as, I think I was expecting something a bit more decadent, but it's still very, I think it's still very fruity. Loads of white fruit, loads of citrus. That meatiness of the Mortlick really comes through, though. Like there's this slightly austere leather tobacco tone. Yeah. And then, especially towards the finish, you're getting a little bit of that ashy Lafroig peat and just a tinge of salty medicinal character, too. That kind of leathery note is like really, really soft, sweet kind of leather, I find. There's a just beyond where things start to like, just as you're getting to where everything starts to dry out on the tongue. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a little bit of a minerality almost, a little bit of like a slight clay note there. Ben's got a good note here, smoked starbursts. Mm -hmm. um, almost a little bit of like smoked candied salmon or something. And James is saying that Compass Box doesn't say it out loud anymore, but this branding is about 
rebelling against the Scotch business's obsession with distancing themselves from some of the old school Scotch marketing. To be fair, some of that old school Scotch marketing was rather sexist um, and deserved to go. And if you need an example of that, take a look at some of the pure Scott marketing from the last few years, which they got called out uh, um, and rightly so on social media for. But uh, yeah, I mean, certainly we love the fact that Compass Box has always been uh, this sort of fearless leader in, you know, challenging the industry norms and preconceptions and, you know, certainly an innovator as well, too. And I've, I've been a fan of them for a long time. John, John Glatzer, I've said for, for many years, is one of my five heroes in the industry that I really look up to um, because he's done something very different. And others have since have followed him as well, too. I think if you look at companies like Dewar's and what they're doing with their blends and the whole reason we're doing a Dewar's tasting is because... The, the whole team, we love this, that double, double series, the 21, 27, and 32. They're all excellent. The 32 is off the charts. Good, especially for the price. Um, but I honestly believe that a part of that came from the blending houses, taking an honest look at what they were doing and going back to just making it about the whiskey and not about the marketing. Um, it's actually right perfect timing here. Harmony is just joining us. Um, I was kind of showing her around the shop a little bit. For those that don't know, Harmony joined our team on the whiskey side of things uh, yesterday, I think it was her first day, um, poaching all the talents in the city. Um, we were walking around the shop and we were talking about Compass Box for a couple of minutes there. And I was also chatting with a customer about it recently. To me, and how we've got the store set up. The blended malts and stuff are married in amongst the single malts, as are some blends, uh, because they're not necessarily looked at any different than single malts. And contrary to what I think a lot of people think with a blended malt, it immediately devalues the whiskey to them for some reason. But if you think about it, it's all fine single malts that end up in a blended malt. And you got somebody like Glazer who does something like, he picks one key malt. In this case, it's probably a brilliant key, uh, a barrel of Mortlac or a couple of barrels of Mortlac. He chooses that as his kind of solitaire and sets a couple of really nice whiskeys around it, like it's a diamond ring or something. You've got the best of all worlds here. We've got a beautiful single malt as your focal point. And if you realize the distillery has a certain characteristic, if you complement that with malts from other distilleries and still have no crappy grain whiskey diabetes. It's a brilliant concept. And it's, um, I think it's a bias that a lot of people need to get their heads around. We'll do another blended malt before the night's out, but I think what Glazer does mm -hmm. with this box has been unparalleled. Mm -hmm. No, and it's and I and it's definitely set the bar. And as you said, I mean, I think you're giving us in one way too much credit in that the blends and blended malts are mixed in amongst the other things because we love them, which is all true. <laughs> but the other part of that is just that it's the section is constantly overfilling and it's just a matter of finding a place to put something. I was trying um, to romanticize it for harmony today and, and pretend it was all organized chaos a little bit. It's, it's organized chaos. It, <laughs> it evolves. The wall evolves. It changes, it goes through phases. It goes through seasons. That's right. So um, sometimes those seasons are dictated by international shipping problems, but and sometimes we consider a season, you know, we have 52 of them in a year at Kensington, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there's, there's uh, and James made another good point here. Like, if you look at some of the components that Compass Box uses in their blends and the age of them, I mean, all you have to do is go back and look at that first no-name bottling and like the vitriol. There was people who were angry that John Glazer would take a parcel of 14-year-old art bag and, and add things to it. And because... I mean, the thirst for our bag, especially mature our bag, is just out of control. But, you know, I was one of those privileged people that got to try the art bag on its own and the creation afterwards. And hands down, he improved it. And James and Jill, I shouldn't just say John, because there's other people behind the scenes that do the blending as well, too. And that's the whole point about it is taking something good and making it better. Um, and on that note, we had some questions about this on social media quite a few recently. We have a new Compass Box blend coming. I mean, technically we've got two more blended malts coming, or sorry, blends, two more young blends, the uh, um, the Artist Series blends. Um, but we've also got a 30th anniversary blend coming next year. 
and there is some cool, cool stuff in it. Um, we had a, we tried it. Um, we asked for some slight tweaks and we were just blown away with what they came back with. So um, that'll be dropping hopefully by May, June, but with shipping, honestly, who knows it's coming next year. It'll be awesome. Uh, and something really to look forward to. Do you, do you remember that day, Andrew, when we were in the shop probably three years ago now, two and a half years ago? Um, and you called Evan and I and said, we have to do a little tasting in the, in the room. We went into the tasting room and Andy was there. We pulled out a round table, threw a white tablecloth on it, and there's only two whiskeys he poured. And I was like, what is this? It was a day I didn't want alcohol in my system. And he poured these two drams and we nosed them. And it was the... the G and M, the McPhail's 1949, and like it was a 68 and a 69 year old or something like that, 67, 68, whatever it was. Um, that's one of my most forgettable, unforgettable tasting experiences at Kensington. The other one that I'm like absolutely tickled pink with was the other day. You had told me when you built the last anniversary bottling we did with Compass Box that blended malt, how special that was getting to do that and everything. This time, just having tried it the first time, having suggested tweaks. And having them to the two of them side by side and seeing what the tweaks did and how incredible that whiskey is now was like uh yeah we we made the right decision on this one that was a pretty cool moment sure. one and you know two things one back to that blending experience i mean this one was a lot simpler like the one we did before took almost two years and they kept getting samples sent back and forth and um at one point that John was planning to throw the, 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 the line wash, which is rinsing the bottling line before you bottle the whiskey so that you don't have contaminants in it, but it's still perfectly good whiskey. And he was toying with this idea of adding this line wash from the circus into the 30th anniversary or 25th anniversary blend. And it didn't work in the end. So it wasn't in there, but it was kind of this, he knew that I'd be like, I'd be geeking out about the fact that there was this line wash in there from this other cool whiskey they did whereas other people might be like there's what in there yeah. um so just yeah the, the the creativity on that is good the other co the comment you made about those uh 1949 glenn uh we can't call them glenn Livets, but they were glenn Livet samples and getting to choose one of those like yeah that was a pretty pretty cool day i still definitely remember that too um one of them was head and shoulders better than the other but they were both really cool just to get to try two different like effectively 68 year old casks at that time. Um, can't belabor okay. this too much. I think we better move on to the, uh, the second whiskey of the night, which is the Daft Mill 2009. Um, if you get the newsletter, the malt messenger, you might've noticed there's actually another Daft Mill arriving tomorrow. So I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. But before we get to that, let's talk about the first one, the 2009, which is a... Asia release. They do releases for the UK, uh, Europe, and for Asia. Um, quite frankly, we're happy just to get some whiskey, period. Uh, the only retailer in Canada, at the very least, I don't know if anyone in the States has gotten Daft Mill yet, but we're the only retailer in Canada that's ever gotten Daft Mill. And it all goes back to the fact that uh, I heard about this crazy distiller, um, Francis Cuthbert, who's a farmer in uh, Fife, and he basically farms and when he's not farming, he makes whiskey. And when he's not making whiskey, he's farming. And the amount of whiskey he makes depends on how good the farming is. Uh, they grow their own barley. Um, it's just an incredible little operation. But to put this in perspective, because we have another new distillery we're going to try later tonight, Arden Merkin. And to, to you know, we've had Rasse launch recently. There's a whole bunch of other new distilleries about to hit the market. Um, Daft Mill is considerably older than all of these distilleries. It traces back to 2015, which is when Kilholman started. But Francis's plan from day one was not to release anything until he felt it was good enough um, to speak for the distillery and the quality of whiskey that he planned to make. Uh, so it wasn't for 12, uh, almost 13 years that he bottled a whiskey. And uh, this is the third release that we've been on, if I'm not correct, Kurt third or yeah i think this is the third one we, there's the third one we have a fourth one coming um tomorrow and all of them so far have been uh we've been really happy with them we've, we've been really impressed with them uh distilled in 2009 bottled in 2020 it's an 11 year old 46 percent mi mixture of ex bourbon barrels and first fill ex sherry casks and uh kurt what are you getting on the nose with this bad boy 
It's a really, really damn cool nose. I'm loving that like almondy marzipan kind of. There's a bit of honey and wax. Mm -hmm. Almost like an orange juice too. Not like a really, really fresh orange note. Just kind of like something that's a little bit tapped down. It's very soft, uh, a little bit doughy. Um, some gentle fruits in there. It's floral. Some faint, slight gingery kind of note back there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, citrus and melons on the nose for fruits. Um, and then, you know, you're even getting into a little bit of that leather and tobacco that you'd expect from the sherry element. It's not big, but it's there. It's there in the background. I'm getting just a faint little bit of like nibs or twizzlers or something back there too. I can see that. Mm. The palate, it's lush. There's some nice juicy malt in there. Um, hey, Daniel, I see you're just tuning in. We were on the Daphnil 2009. So thanks, Adam, for chiming in with that. We just finished with Compass Box Menagerie. So you've only missed one whiskey. Uh, you should be able to catch up to us uh, pretty easily. Um, yeah, Kurt, I, I was just quickly glancing at my tasting note that I wrote when we first brought this in. And of course, you know, the day it comes in, we, we had to crack a bottle of it to try it. Um, but it, it, to me, the nose is like, it, there's, there's a maturity to the nose, but there's also kind of a, something that reminds me of old school whiskey. And the one that I'm going to bring into this, and I'm pretty sure you've tried it with our friend, Doug, is that, um, Glenlivet 12 year special reserve bottling that he's been buying a bunch of on the, the auction markets That's like a, in your office when you brought in the bottle. I think so. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a 1970s era Glenlivet and it's just, there's, it has that sort of same silky waxy fruity floral thing going on to me. That's just, it's not something you see a lot in whiskeys today. Some pineapple notes there too. Mm -hmm. I get some of that pineapple on the palate too, but it's not juicy like mushroom mm -hmm. pineapple. It's almost like it's been caramelized, but burnt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, the palette for me is, is, I mean, I don't think this is quite old enough to have this in abundance, but it's starting to go into that slightly tropical territory. I'm also getting a bit of a cheesiness to this too. Um, I'm pretty sure Daff Mill has very long fermentations. They, they don't distill 24-7. Um, so some of the fermentations run a little long. The distillation is very slow, um, but it's, it's a spirit that I think is drinking very well right now. And I think that there's also just incredible potential for this as it matures. Anybody that's like a bread maker, there's like, um, if you let everything rise and do its thing and it's about to go in the oven, if you've tasted that raw bread dough, um, there's a little bit of that on the back end of the palate too. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty cool. Yeah, but very pretty, elegant, lovely. Um, we have a new twist on Daft Milk coming on Wednesday, as I mentioned. Um, we're getting the 2008 winter batch release, which is a bit of a curiosity because I'm not sure where they sent this batch uh, because it wasn't European, Asian, or um, UK. And it was also a bigger batch, 6,000 bottles that were released um, and 100% first fill ex bourbon. All of the other releases we've seen so far have been a mix of bourbon and sherry. Um, this one is 100% ex bourbon. Um, so I'm kind of keen to try this one because I think we're going to see a ton of distillery character coming through even more so than we are with this, that just hundred percent bourbon background is going to be, a, you know, very much a, a much more naked version of this whiskey. This is, there's something about this that reminds me of what, uh, I think Convalmore might've been like when it was quite young, mm -hmm. got a little bit of that austere sort of character that develops into nice caramels and fruits as it gets older. Um, I'm already seeing some of that character here. And I think, you know, if the, that black and white label wasn't enough to already scream you know, Port Ellen to me, this kind of slightly old school style, as you hinted that earlier, is 100% in my wheelhouse. Nowadays, you get, it doesn't have to be old or anything. As long as it's got that little bit of an old school type character, I'm happy with it. Mm -hmm. This is a wicked whiskey. Yeah. And I can honestly say, um, this is the weakest of the Daphnil I've tried so far, and I adore it. So, so man, I'm super excited for what these guys are doing. Well, and um, 
you know, you look at the guys who are behind this, um, not just Francis Cuthbert, but Daphnil has a partnership with Berry Brothers and Rudd, which is another part of the reason why we're the only retailers that have it, because we've got a very long standing relationship with Berry Brothers and Rudd. But Berry Brothers Master Distiller or Master Blender, um, a guy by the name of Doug, Dougie McIver, has been consulting with Daphnil to make sure they're right. Um, but the other guy who's behind this is Johnny McMillan. And if that name doesn't sound familiar, um, he's one of Angus McRail's buddies. Um, he's one of the guys or was one of the guys behind uh, the, the old and rare show. Um, he's got an incredible depth of knowledge and experience. And, you know, whether it was the advice that, that Francis got starting off or his own innate talents or bringing in these other individuals who've got a lot of talent and skill as well, um they've definitely been doing things right and uh yeah really been impressed by them and i agree kurt i, I think this this batch is not as exciting as the first two that we had but i've tried the 2008 that's coming in my, my tasting notes up on the website it is awesome that straight first fill bourbon one so this is um, cool like that's you know it's kind of damning it with faint praise when yeah. i'm telling you this is a whiskey i love and still saying it's the weakest of what we tried. It just speaks to the quality we're seeing from these guys already. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Shelter Point did something similar locally where you've got to give it to these guys. And Park and Bound, same thing. When the spirit was of age, they weren't ready to release it. It was like, this isn't where we want it to be and we're going to hold off. It, it hurts financially, but, you know, integrity was more important. I love yeah. that. Well, and I, I, I don't even think, I mean, integrity might be part of it, but I think it was just for this distillery, it was more about, you know, everything was done cautiously and to budget and with patience. I mean, and I, I suppose if you're a farmer, that's something that comes innate to you is patience. Like you got to wait for, you got to wait for the season to come and then you got to wait for your crops to grow. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, to me, that's such a cool uh, story that it's not rushed to market. I mean, you know, I agree with the shelter point, but, you know, just a little ways down the island, you got another guy who's trumpeting how good his new make and six-year-old is and or six-month-old and one-year-old and all the awards it's winning, which, spoiler alert, everybody wins awards. Um, they're relatively meaningless. Um, yeah, I mean, we like that. I mean, I think you could say the same thing to a lesser extent about Arden Merkin. Like they waited until they had five, six-year-old whiskey. They didn't just rush out and bottle three-year-olds. So there's some distilleries that have done it right. And, and I definitely believe Daft Mill is one of them. Um, it's not open to, to the public. He is a, a busy man farming and distilling um, people in the trade. And that's how I got to see him. In fact, I had to basically beg through people that knew him to, to go and see the place. But it's, it's, a, it's a crazy little distillery. And when I was there, every single bit of farm building was crammed to the rafters with casks. Um, there was literally nowhere else. I think he was planning to build a warehouse at that point, but uh, really cool story. And just excited to be the, 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 the place that has Daft Mill in, in the country. Um, any other comments, Kurt, or should we, should we dram on to the next one? I'm envious you got to see it now. I got to see it. Yeah. Well, next time you're over, I'm sure it can be arranged. Um, all right. Tormor. Um, Kurt, I'm going to, I might let you even start on this one because this is, this is one that you kind of, of all of us, you were the one most excited to get this one into the shop. Yeah. I'm, I'm a sucker for Tormor. I can't lie. Um, you can ignore the distillery bottling that 14 year old OB if you can even find it around. I don't even know if they have it anymore. It was, probably slightly less than mediocre, if I'm being honest. Um, but Tormor through the Indies, when you start to hit the teens, um, mid-20s, you're in really, really cool fruity territory. There's some distilleries like Glen Talkers and Linkwood and um, Tormor and, you know, Glen Berge, a couple others that are really, really fruit-driven. Uh, but that fruitiness tends to come out in ex-bourbon at that 20-year mark, give or take a little bit. I fell in love with Tormor primarily over a really old, awesome sour oli bottling. Um, but then this one, when this set of samples came through, I was like, holy crap, are we actually going to get a 25 year old Tormor? The price was right. It hit the floor at a brilliant price for a 25 year old cask straight Tormor. Um, and I love, I love, I love that you leave it a few minutes in the glass and some of the tighter notes open up a little bit. And the palate is all just tropical. 
ends up with a slightly bitter grapefruity kind of tone. That I really mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, not to quite the same extent, but I'm, I'm also been a big fan of Tormor, um, but primarily Tormors that have very little cask influence. So not even ex bourbon, but really like refill ex bourbon or tired old sherry casks that are really just allowing the, the spirit to naturally oxidize in it. I think Tormor at a young age, in my experience, is a little rough. And it's probably how the whiskey's made. Um, it needs time and cask for oxidation. It needs time to polish off those rougher edges in the spirit. And uh, yeah, I think that's what we've got here. That's why we're so excited about this is just, it's just so fruity, so tropical, so soft on the nose. And you can still get that malty, faintly meaty character coming through too, but it's really the fruits that are shining. You don't have uh, a picture of Tormor, do you? I'll find one. Because, yeah, we do <laughs> talk, you and I have talked about this before. Um, I like to say it's the Willy Wonka of distilleries. Like if Willy Wonka built a distillery in Scotland, um, it's what, what the distillery would look like. You'll see some rad distilleries if you get over there. And Strath Island might be maybe the most picturesque of all. Edgardour looks a bit like Hogwarts. You know, on Isla, they're iconic with their um, pagoda roofs and such. But uh, nothing will prepare you for Tormor. It's almost surreal. And Andrew's right. It looks like it should be. It looks like it's been Willy Wonka eyes. There we go. There's a there's a there's a picturesque little shot of it from a little little stream, a little burn running by the distillery. Um, this is a pretty good one. Gives you a pretty good idea of it. You know, another word I think that would work for this is steampunk. This is like a steampunk distillery. Right. Yeah. Um, but this one here, which is a little zoomed out, is probably the best angle. Again, gives you a good idea of it. And the garden out front, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's a cool yeah. distillery. Um, it also ca almost caused me to get into an accident once because if you're driving into the space side, I think it's the A95 um, leads into the space side. And as you're coming around this corner, all of a sudden there's a distillery there and you're on these narrow winding little roads with no shoulder on the other side of the road. And you barely have time to blink and you've passed it. And you know, these roads, people are driving hundred kilometers an hour on them. So there's just, there's just no time to stop and, or slow down. There's always traffic on that road. It's a busy little corridor, but it's, it's a beautiful little distillery. And it's uh, sadly one of the few I haven't visited. I, I, I've yet to visit. So we'll have to get that on the list. Hey, Kurt, pallet. Thoughts on the pallet? So I haven't made enough there yet. Definitely malty. Some nice tropical fruits coming in there. But it, it is a little austere too. Like it's got a bit of like dry grassy malt. It takes me into that kind of tangy pucker up a little bit. A little bit of pink grapefruit. A little bit of guava kind of thing going on in the pile there. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's quite firm oak on it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and the malty notes are a lot stronger than I would expect in something that noses this soft. And to well, me, especially it, something at 25 years of age. For sure. I love that arrival. I love mm -hmm. that even though it's got those kind of, they'd seem like almost bittering notes, it's not tannic and grippy. Like it's still mouth watering in the back end too. Mm -hmm. Well, um, looking at my tasting note on this one, one of the notes that came out on the palate was five alive. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of see that because as you're saying, there's that, there, there's that nice fruitiness, but there's an acidity with it. There's a, there's a crisp sort of citrus uh, tang to it. But I miss Ryan's comment there, but somebody said same. We like it. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Well, Ryan said it was the best one so far, which is high praise no matter how you look at it. It's either the best Tormor he's ever had or the best <laughs> drama of the night so far. And in either case, it's it's a it's a compliment. We'll take it's it. Win. It's a win. It's a win. It's totally a win. We should be suckering harmony into sharing some notes here with us too. Yeah, when she's ready, and uh, you know, we could always invite her in towards the end too if if she likes. She's not as familiar with some of these as the rest of us are. Um, so we'll put her on the spot, but Harmony, you certainly are welcome to join if you feel up to it. Um, all right, McCallan. Um, we did this a couple years ago with the 12 year old. Um, 
The 12 year old Sherry Cass came back after almost a decade. For those of you who don't know the story, back in the old days, and Kurt and I are old enough to know, remember the good old days, back when McAllen 18 was like the benchmark. Even the 12 year old, I think you could say, was the benchmark uh, whiskey, space side Sherry Cass whiskey of its day. And then they ran out of it, or at least they said they ran out of it, and they came out with Fine Oak, and then there was the Crayola collection, or as some others have referred to it, the Stripper collection, because they were all named, was it Gold, Amber, Sienna, and Ruby. And, you know, in defense of the range, I quite liked both Sienna and Ruby. I thought, although some batches of Sienna were better than others, the Sienna and the Ruby, I thought, were both decent whiskeys for the price they were asking, but there was that loss of transparency. No one knew what how old they were anymore. People felt they were getting hoodwinked. Um, fast forward, the 12-year-old came back uh, a couple months ago, or a couple years, or about a year ago now, wasn't it? Last year, maybe? Yeah. And we opened a bottle because we were curious. And it was almost bittersweet because I actually think it's a the new 12-year Sherry Oak is a well-made whiskey it is. it's not the old one but it's but it's good it's a it's a good whiskey and it, it does taste of, like it's in the vein of older like the old school yeah. it's not quite as good like you said but it is in mm -hmm. the vein at least this time yeah and it's 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 a worthy successor understanding that the supply of old sherry casts are not quite what they used to be the demand for the whiskey is through the roof um albeit the price is now twice what it used to be 10 years ago but Whiskey flations have, you know, affected a lot of things over the last 10, 15 years. But I'm approaching this McAllen 18 tonight with the same, the same eyes where I remember the old stuff. I wouldn't say I felt let down in that interim, but certainly, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worried that I might be a little too hard on this. Kind of like how I was worried when I tried the McAllen 12 year I would be too hard on it because, um, you know, maybe there is a little bit of residual anger there. I think the worst of it for me was that around the same time McAllen started to decline in terms of quality, in my estimation, was around the same time when they really, really started to, they themselves, premiumize the brand a bit more and position it as a luxury brand and everything was not McAllen the whiskey, but McAllen the brand. Um, I think those kind of things coincided just a little too close for my liking. It was like, no, before is when you should have been the Cadillac. Now you're really kind of a Kia. <laughs> I hate to say it. But. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know if it, when, when was the tasting. It might have been the last society outturn when we were talking about the distillery and how Evan and I went to see it two years ago and I left feeling angry. Um, it's architecturally, it's a beautiful building, but it's a monument to the vanity of one brand that seems to think it's so much more special than everything else. And you know what? They, they, they seem to be able to command the price point that they ask for. So I guess they're able to get away with it. But uh, I, I, you know, if you're going to go see it, just do yourself a favor, do the shortest possible tour because the good tours that take three hours, you know, all you get is maybe one or two additional whiskeys at the end of it, but you just have to, they just drag out the process of walking you through the distillery that much longer. And architecturally it's cool, but once you've been in there, I think if you've been to other distilleries, it'll make you homesick for the small, cozy, cramped, you know, slightly neglected, partially run down distilleries that, uh, you know, also make great whiskey and are not, don't look like a spaceship from the future. All right, Kurt. We want to be we've, mad. We moaned it. We've moaned enough about the brands. Yeah. I, again, I'm pretending there's no price tag on this or anything. I'm not being unfair by comparing it to, you know, those earlies that we had. Mm -hmm. This is really pretty whiskey. Mm -hmm. This is really good sherry. Yeah, it's chocolatey, dark yeah. fruits. There's a bit of a bit of maple syrup and treacle in there too. It's chocolate bars with bits of like 
cherry and raspberry and pomegranate and stuff in them where you've got dark fruits meets chocolate. It's kind of jammy still. Black forest cake. That's like chocolate, cherries and like creme fraiche or whatever that is. Uh, whipped cream. 43% is a crime on a whiskey like that. Like that nose is pretty. Can you imagine what that would be like amped up to about 54, 52, 54%? Palette's very, palette's very good. I, I want to be angry with this. Like, I, I want to be mad at it. Um, would I buy a bottle of this personally? Absolutely not. Um, and part of the reason for it is, and I'll, I'll share my screen now, we've only received six bottles of this in the recent past. And we, you know, we, Kurt and I and Evan and I suppose Harmony now and Sean and all the other guys on the team, guys and gals. Oh, this is the double cast. That's not even the right one. I got to find the right one. Um, we want to know what these things taste like too. So if only six bottles come through the shop, sure, we could sell all six like that. Um, but this way, at least 40 people get to try them. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think the whiskey's, the whiskey is frankly great. But again, would I, would I personally buy this um, at the price that, that we were charging? <laughs> I don't even remember what it was, but it was definitely well north of five. Yeah, I think it was between five and six. So I wouldn't um, buy it at that price, but would I buy it? Like if the price was a bit more fair, yes, this is a whiskey I would love to have. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think 18, 18 year old, 43% whiskey should be $500. You're paying for a name because a lot of distilleries can produce in this style. Yeah, 560 is the uh, price tag on that. And just before I shared my screen, I saw a comment there that you could have a Glen Goyne 25 for the same price, 100%. You could also have five bottles of Tamdu 15 for the same price. And that's a hell of a whiskey, um, you know, certainly from a value perspective. Um, when available, like the Aaron 21 or the, you know, the 18, those are another couple of really good whiskeys you could have for a fraction of the price. Um, I hope the people that are buying this are drinking it um because i certainly it's hard to see how an 18 year old mccallum is going to go up in value that much um if you even dream of such things but uh yeah and jeff's pointing out tamdu 15 is on sale at this moment as well it, it sure is so you know a very good deal james pointing out glen alecky 15 sorry james how could we forget glen alecky 15 that is that's another great malt um very good sherry cask matured whiskey at the price um but uh yeah we're not seeing much of it but glendronic um it's hard to argue with the quality there we've had some slightly more tame versions of the 15 recently um still awesome but not what they used to be not quite the fireworks show but glendronic still has ridiculous sherry casks there i've been there within the last couple of years there's tons of cool glendronic still to hit our shores hopefully in more volume at some point they're still probably my my heavyweight in the sherry world. Aberlauer has fantastic, maybe slightly more floral style of big sherry. Um, just kind of going back to the question that was asked earlier, what were good sherry alternatives to become? Um, mm -hmm. And then I would honestly say, don't get hung on a distillery. Just watch some of the independent bottlings to find a random, really heavily sherry Blair Apple or something. Like we've had tons of random, really, really big old sherry releases from oddball distilleries over the last couple of years. You can find some really neat stuff and go off the beaten path a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, so verdicts, if we take price out. Um, I love it. Yeah. I, I really love the nose. The palate's a little bit flatter, but uh, that's awesome to see. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> And Tyrone saying you can't beat the 105. Um, Hong saying Glendronic 21 is, is, is good too. Um, again, that's one though where it's a little bittersweet because there are those of us who remember back when you could get Glendronic 21 for $120. Um, so yeah, nevertheless, we, uh, we digress. Uh, on to something a little less mature and very curious. Um, some of you who joined us for the Arden American virtual tasting we did way back in January, uh, I was January or February, I'm pretty sure it was January. 
um, with uh, Connell McKenzie from Adelphi and Arda Merkin. Um, we broke apart a little gift pack they had. Um, and that, uh, that one had a cask sample of Arda Merkin from a Paul Lanois champagne cask. Um, what's cool about this whiskey is um, we can mention it, but the distillery can't mention anything about champagne cask because the SWA gets all pissy about that. Um, this is not straight um, Paul Lenoir champagne cask, which would be French oak. Um, it's a mix of nine bourbon barrels, which were then re-racked and finished into Paul Lenoir champagne and one American oak sherry cask to balance things out a little bit. Um, Ardner Merkin is another new distillery like Daft Mill that, you know, I've, I've been to it a couple times. I think they're certainly one of the best new distilleries out on the market. Um, they make both peated and unpeated spirit. Uh, they, they do slow distillations, uh, long fermentations, um, and mature everything on site. Um, they're also one of the first, I think, carbon neutral, or they've attempted to be carbon neutral distilleries. And it's in the wildest, most remote part of Scotland, north of the Isle of Mull. Um, absolutely beautiful. But uh, the whiskey, I think, has uh, definitely caught our attention uh, since it was launched um, well in Canada, I think late last year, or maybe just before Christmas, the first release came in. Um, and man, right off the bat, there is there is some fun and interesting things happening on the nose here. That's a really good follow for an 18-year-old McAllen. I'm blown away that a, what is Five-year-old, yeah, five-year-old Arden American. Wow. You just, you just drink McAllen 18 and then you put your nose into five-year-old Arden American. And it's like opening a bag of Jelly Bellies and smelling all the aromas all at once. It doesn't smell five years old to me at all. Um, there's some like, some really tart red, there's some like um, cranberry and rhubarb like a little bit of lemon and orange on it or something. There, there's a lot going on in this. Like I'm getting root beer on the nose on this too. Peanut butter. It's almost as though they mashed a bag of jelly bellies with the malt, you know, fermented it up. It's really, really syrupy sweet on the nose though. And not in a bad way. It's because sweet whiskeys generally kind of tend to send me the other way. Oh, man. Oh, is this the most elegant thing in the range tonight? No. Is it possibly the most fun? I would say almost yes. Um, Sean said this stuff is wild. Um, you know, the, the like, Kurt, you mentioned the bit about, uh, or sorry, I see Chris Walker's got San Pellegrino there. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on to isolate things on this this is oh i don't know i'm loving we had this discussion in the last taste too i'm loving this new school way of managing wine casks mm -hmm. i've been scared shitless of wine casks for a really long time you have too i'm trying tons of wine casks lately that don't seem wine to that don't have that weird sour or funkiness to them that are just like sweeter and fruitier or something going on there this is another one where it doesn't seem whiny to me at all no no um yeah i'm getting more like root beer sarsaparilla kind of tones on the palate uh, i'm getting more jelly bellies i'm getting all kinds of stuff um and it's a little bit all over the place but i think we can forgive it a bit because this is a young whiskey but there's some nice chocolate in there there's a little bit of sherry tones subtle peat but under that curd is the one thing that i love about our demerkin is there's a little bit of that cheesy funk there is there's a like lot of washed, I was going to say like washed rind brie. There was a, a young single malt out of Montana, the rough stock stuff. I don't know if you ever tried that. They had some pretty aggressive bourbon casks. It almost tastes like some of this was in some of those barrels. A lot of cherry cinnamon kind of tones going on in the palate too. Really rambunctious oak. That's a... <laughs> That's a hell of a whiskey. Holy crap, I did not expect that. Yeah. And just to let everybody know, that is not a 43% whiskey. No, no yeah, the, it is definitely mislabeled. Um, Chelsea, Chelsea's not on here tonight or we could make fun of her in person, but yeah, 57.6%. 
Um, and like the Daft Mill, it's not an inexpensive bottling, but the quality is there. And, you know, this is a, this is a spirit that's incredibly well made. I think, again, like Daft Mill, I mean, even like Kilholman, um, I think this is a distillery that's showing its potential very early on. We were talking about this, one of the more recent tastings, Kurt, about how even like we've had that stuff in the whiskey in from Rasse uh, recently too, that also shows promise. I don't think it's quite as um, well-made as, as this is, but a lot of these new distilleries, like they're, they're leaning on hundreds of years of experience and knowledge and best practice and new practice and knowledge and technology. Um, and, you know, I wonder if this 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 is going to have some of the bigger brands getting a little nervous because they're they're making compelling stuff. The, the challenge is whether the big brands can squeeze them out of the market by just pricing them out. Um, and I think there's a risk we will see some of that. But uh, yeah, it's it's kind of fun. I'm digging a lot of the new distilleries right now. Um, I'd say the, the ones I've been least excited about over the last few years are Avangeric and Wolfburn, but the others, you know, Daphnel, Rasse, Arden American, Waterford out of Ireland, um, all of these guys are producing a really young spirit that's really bloody good right out of the gates. And I think you tried some of the same new make I have over there recently. Mm -hmm. Ardenho and Lag mm -hmm. both have fantastic new makes. Yeah. Lag, Lag especially blew me away. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Kurt, I don't know if you remember way back two two weeks ago, or was it one week ago? Way back. When, <laughs> way, way, way back. I mean, in COVID times, anything more than 24 hours is way back. Um, but it was the uh, the Cooper's Choice, that um, Lowland Smoke, the Inch Darny. Even yep. that one's kind of crazy, wild, and fun, and has potential, and like Daft Mill, the guy who owns it is not going to release a drop of it, or he's not going to do any of his own bottlings until it hits a dozen years of age. That was interesting as hell, that one. But I do believe that one succeeded in spite of itself. I think that was just so much oh, roller coaster. I think it was a lucky bottling that turned out okay. But I think that whiskey is still too young and not ready to be bottled. Oh, what our sure. is doing, I think, is right. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree on that. And uh, anyway. That's uh, Arden American Paul and all bottling. It's awesome. Very cool. Um, curious, interesting, fun stuff. We've got two to go. We're going back to Kensington Wine Market casks. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's move on to the blended malt, the mystery blended malt. Now, sorry, go ahead. You know, no, you go. This one to me is a case of what do those guys know? <laughs> Kensington. So I want to be totally honest with everybody here. Um, I wear my heart on my sleeve when it comes to picking my favorites and sharing honestly what we have. Um, when we picked these three Berry Brothers that we're drinking tonight, Evan, Andrew, and I, and I don't think Sean was involved on these. Um, I think it was just the three of us. The Tormor lit me up like nobody's business. I was like so excited to have a 25-year-old Tormor. Um, the flavors were brilliant, the soft fruits, everything. The one we're going to do last was a real shocker to me because we'd had a couple of Orkneys and I was like, oh, cool. I can't wait to do this one too. Um, and it was more robust and richer. I was like, this one's going to be exciting for people. And then this one that we're about to have now, I was like, great value mall, 21 years old. You know, I didn't think anything too special. When they arrived, I completely flipped, completely flipped. This one was lights out my favorite. I was on Twitter right away. Like, holy crap, this is probably my new favorite store cast. Um, the Tormor fell in behind it, and then the the other one came in behind that. But this one lit me up, and right away sales went crazy. So yeah, we can see a lot of people are on board with this one too. Yeah. Well, Kurt, I, I'm actually going to clarify your memory even more on this. Do it. Um, you're right. It was you, Evan, and I trying these cask samples, but you and Evan were slightly against this one, and I was pushing for it. So I so the next day I called Sean into the office and ask for him to try it. And he's like, oh man, that's good. So I was like, all right, sweet. It's not all just right. me. So I pulled the trigger on it. And I, to be honest, I was a bit nervous about it because 
you guys were not as enamored. I, it was actually my favorite of the three casks. Um, the Orkney made sense because it's Sherry Cask and it's Highland Park. But this one to me, there was something about it that I loved. And I mean, God bless the Berry Brothers. They send us great opportunities, but the samples they send are tiny. I mean, so <laughs> we're, we're, we have like 15 mils between four of us to choose a cask, basically. And sometimes and they come in comically large sample bottles too for how much is in there. But I loved this one and it came in. But there's, I think there's another thing that we have to acknowledge, Kurt, which is that we all assumed, even after we first tasted this, that this was probably more or Edrington stock, maybe with some Laphroaig or something um, fatted into it. We weren't entirely sure what it was, but none of us were on target as to what it actually probably is. And that's Glen Scotia. This, this is probably 99.9%, Glen Scotia. If we got confirmation of that, I'd believe it, but I still, in my heart of heart, thinks it might have something like Glen Scotia in it, but with mm -hmm. some Highland Park and McAllen. Well, you say that, but uh, um, so I, I got... Uh, I got one of the Berry Brothers guys on the spot on this and I, I asked them and I pushed him on it. He said, truly, truly, we don't know, but we got it from the Loch Lomond group. And mm -hmm. when you nose and taste it, this is nothing like Loch Lomond. This is not, no. I mean, there could be a dash of it in there, but when you start peeling this it back, true. I mean, you can start to see some similarities between this and that heavily sherried was a 1999 Glen Scotia cask that they bottled for us. Like you can see the sherry notes. The peat is not quite as strong in this, but that oiliness is there. And underneath it, you're starting to get into some of those tropical fruit tones as well, too. Yeah, it's that, again, that sour fruit tang that I think, you know, at the risk of creating even more buzz, to me is always, it's Ben Nevis and it's the spring bank or Glen Scotia style. Um, they tend to be the only ones that get that kind of weird funkiness. I think it's verging on kind of lactic, not quite there, but into that kind of sour, this sounds bad, I don't mean it this way, but that sour kind of almost fruity fruit note. Um, mm -hmm. It's something I chase in whiskey. This is a, like that, that note on the palate, the mid palate is incredible. Well, it's the one thing that I was bang on when I tasted it for the first time even in retrospect, knowing what it potentially could be is this, this is an old school style whiskey. This is whiskey like it was made in the seventies and the eighties. Um, and I, you know, that comment about the lactic, no, the tropical fruit tones coming through, like this is old school, long fermentation, slow distillation whiskey. And it's awesome. And in answer to Jeff's question, we're not going to run out of this tomorrow, but we've sold more than half of it. Um, since it dropped about six weeks ago. And the reason for that is because it's because it's awesome. That it's got such a perfect degree of smoke that works with those fruits. It's like smoked five Yeah. Uh, and it's oily, it's viscous, it's coating. The finish is lovely. Yeah, that's a that's a banger, as they'd say in the old country. Um, it's a banger of a single, or well, blended malt, quote unquote, blended malt. But yeah, damn, tasty, tasty stuff. Uh, all right. That leaves us with our Orcadian dram. And I've been neglecting our friends on Facebook who are still commenting. I see we've got Renee Jacob. Um, is watching down in Lethbridge, low Renee. We got Eugene uh, somewhere. Not sure exactly where Eugene is, but nice to see you as well too. Thanks for for tuning in. Um, if you guys have any questions, I will pop back there to to check in on them in a minute. Um, <laughs> Paul Walters up in Fort Mac saying the next order is going to be an expensive one. Well, um, we're sorry, kind of. <laughs> not really no no we we take pride in enabling 
Just and we're we're victims of our own enabling as well too so there's nothing worse than being drummed up by your colleagues whose palates you trust and who you've gotten to know over the years every now and then sean will message me and he'll be like oh dude we opened this one it's so good i'll be like oh damn you want to count oh be it's yeah let's see other ryan ryan i'm sorry we've we've already tempted you with six bottles we're very sorry um we're what can we say we're bad people but we have good hearts so i keep mine in a jar over there <laughs> okay all right on to the mystery orkney i think this is our fourth mystery orkney cask from berry brothers and hey, come on mystery orkney is like yeah you know, solving murder mysteries for preschoolers. No. <laughs> exactly hard stuff. No, there's only two distilleries in the Orkneys. One of them was not operating at this time. So it's pretty easy to figure out which one we're talking about. Um, the only thing is, is there's no Viking, Viking iconography on the bottle. So, um, you know, if that was there, that might be a bit more of a giveaway. Um, but this particular one here is from a Sherry Butt, if I'm not mistaken, matured for 17 years, bottled at 59.9%. That's a lucky number because if it had been 60.0%, we would have had to charge more because the government would have taken more tax. Um, and um, Kurt, this is also reminding of another recent tasting we did, um, Highland Park, when we just, we all decided we'd crack a bunch of Highland Parks because we didn't realize that fire and ice and light and dark were still available and some other bad premises we all rolled them into a tasting and a few of them were actually still quite good yes. um horrifically priced yes um but one of the ones that stood out i believe was the dark the highland okay. park the dark and it i like sherry the and the ice i like the two burgers yes. they were better um well i can't remember who else was on that tasting but we really liked i think we really liked the dark um, we didn't like care much for fire. I believe that was a unanimous pan on fire. Um, but this cask versus the dark is less than half the price for Sherry Cask Highland Park at a higher proof. And uh, yeah, what do we think? Can we coin a term though? You were kind of chirping for a minute there when you said Viking iconography. Can we call it Viconography from now on? Oh man, that's good. I like that. Viconography. Highland Park Viconography. <laughs> um, this is a dirty one. It's um, It's got a lot of like coal and flinty notes to me. It's got some popcorn, caramel corn kind of stuff going on there too. Kurt, that might be the second Kensington wine market word coined for the whiskey industry to which they owe us. The other one being my my Isla alternatives, which I came up with when we did our Isla festival. We didn't have enough Isla whiskeys, so we needed Isla alternatives, peated whiskeys from other places. And uh, so, yeah, I think we should both be in the Oxford English Dictionary. I actually think it's more a case of you know a million monkeys with a million typewriters. I think we've lucked upon a couple of things with how many stupid things we've said tripping over our own drunken tongues. It's more like and that. and said monkeys were given drams. <laughs> good drams, at least. Happy monkey. Very good, very very good drams. Okay, so <laughs> I noticed some people are firing some things into the chat. I haven't even had a chance to glance at them yet. Um, Rakesh saying sherry flavors on the nose. James. James Bourne saying dollar store marshmallow candies. Is that, James, you don't like buying your kids the good marshmallows or was that for the last whiskey? Um, what else have we got? Twisted Tattoo, good for a decent price. Uh, Dark Origins was excellent for the price when it was around. Jeff, I have to agree to disagree with you on that one. Um, I did have at least one good bottling of Dark Origins, but I also had a, a number of over-the-top, ruinously sulfured batches of Dark Origins. You know, I, I actually didn't speak with the McCallum rep for a couple of years. He got mad at me. He, he had a falling out with Andrew, too. I mean, now he and I are quite friendly. We send each other you know, messages back and forth every now and then. Oh, is this Daniel? Yes. Oh. Good friend, Dan. Um, I, I still don't know why he was mad at me. 
Well, with me, he got mad because I was campaigning against NAS for a long time there. And at a whiskey festival that I paid 150 bucks a ticket for, he actually turned his back on me at the table and said, I'm not pouring for you and walked away. He, he did the same thing to me, although I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't pay anything to go to it. It was a, it was a whiskey festival in a pink hotel somewhere near Abbotsford. <laughs> um, it was a, a well-intentioned, but perhaps not well-attended event. And I went to go say hi to him thinking I could break the ice. And yeah, he, he literally didn't even say anything. He just turned. <laughs> I was like, whoa, you'd, you'd think I'd like broken into his hotel room and dropped a, <laughs> dropped a deuce on his pillow. But and there we go. Who knows? To this day, I still don't know why he was mad at me. And and I actually feel I was defending. I thought you were gonna say no, maybe I did. Because because as I've said tonight, I thought the Ruby and the Sienna were both pretty decent, regardless okay. of how I didn't like the whole campaign they did. But anyway. Tyrone, nothing lasts forever. What's that? Tyrone has kids, he should know the answer to that. Of course, you steal your kids' candy. That's just why you have kids. Oh. I think I've missed a, a few things in the chat. Recent Halloween bias. Huh. And uh, you, you, you must have been lucky, Jeff. Honestly, like I had a couple of batches, different batches of Dark Origins that were both just terrible. But there was at least one. Who knows? Like they might have done 10 bottlings of it and maybe. Two of them were bad and eight were great. And I just happened to sample the two bad ones. But uh, yeah, that one did not jive with me. Sky remembers the same event, the Pink Palace um, with the strange hotel rooms and the weird individual air conditioning units. And yeah, it was an interesting event. But there was Bentleys there because that's how you know it's a good whiskey festival when there's a couple <laughs> of Bentleys parked out front um anyway back to the whiskey I'm kind of wandering here this we needed cam on here tonight cam could have kept us on the straight and narrow ah straight and narrow is boring nobody wants to hear the straight and narrow um you know it was a real banger before we get right back into this dark origins not my thing like andrew just way too much sulfur uh but if you ever had a chance at full volume it was around up until just recently it was 18 year old Highland Park for a fraction of the price because it was ex bourbon as opposed to sherry and bourbon and stuff. Um, really, really great whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is kind of very sherry. It's very sherry, but not like over the top. It's nutty, it's syrupy. Um, I would guess this is kind of like, I would call this like a sweet Oloroso style. Like, it's definitely not, to my mind, going into that PX territory. But there, there's some really nice sherry tones on this. I think that's why we jumped at this one was just the sherry on this is very good. And you're right. We work off small samples. Um, and they're not always, again. Not, not always, Kurt. I mean, and James is on here. So we might as well, like Compass Box and Glen Allocky have both sent decent sized samples. So, For sure. you know. Sorry, I was meeting with berries. Yeah, well, with berries and samples, yeah. sometimes it's barely enough for me to taste all on my own. For sure. This one, I think, um, I'm not sure how I didn't pick up on it when it was just a sample, but there's even this much sulfur is too much for me. I struggle with it. It's a little bit of that flinty, you know, gunpowdery, struck match yeah. kind of that I'm struggling with. To me, I don't get that. To me, this is that dry, nutty, sherry tones that come through. Um, I honestly think that's that Highland Park, that gentle Highland Park peat coming through. Like for me, I don't know that I would say this is sulfury, but agree to disagree. And James, thanks for fighting hard for those hundred mil samples. I certainly <laughs> appreciate them. Tyrone's saying, I still really like the distillery 18 year old, very good whiskey and the price is decent. Uh, I don't know. I struggle with that, that 18 and like Kurt, do you remember what was the verdict? We, we, cause we sampled that Highland park 18 this summer when we did yeah. our Highland park tasting. Yeah. I remember the nose being great. I remember we commented on really, really digging the nose and thinking, yeah, okay, this is good. It's not at the price point good enough though, uh, for 43%, whatever it was. And then the palate was just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It's over, it's over like, uh, 
I think it's over two hundred dollars now too. It is. I think it's two ten right now. It was up to two twenty a few years back. So to their credit, they did drop it about ten. Yeah, they've they've wound it. Well, part of that too is um, some of the big importers like Beam Suntory who import Edrington. Um, they try to price Alberta so that it works out to be the same as BC, Ontario, and Quebec, except they only assume that we make um, twenty percent margins. And when we actually put a reasonable retail margin on it, we end up being more expensive than the rest of the country. Um, and I think that's an example of when things finally, they had, they realized they had to pedal it back a bit. Um, you know, Bowmore is another good example. Bowmore used to be cheaper in Alberta by 25%. Now it's 15% more expensive, but then they put everything on these massive blowouts every three months because they can't sell it at the price that they think it should be line priced across the country. Yeah, it's, you know, and there was a comment there, good point regarding the ABB at 43%. I think um, everybody reviews based on, you know, nose, palate, finish, whatever. If mm -hmm. I'm buying a bottle of whiskey, I'm buying all of those things. And when you water it down to 43% and chill filter it, you're stripping out all the oils that give you the finish. You're literally taking out one of the most important components of the whiskey. Don't charge mm -hmm. me for it if you're taking it away from me and at 210 bucks you're charging me more than you need to honestly yeah, yeah. we got two comments here dave saying try any highland park from eight from 18 from 10 years ago versus now it's a shadow of its former self and i completely agree um my brother and i used to drink of all the highland park 18 at christmas and that was like our christmas dram back you know 10 12 years ago and i i even though it's as kurt said it's decent like it's not bad it's just not that used to be a great whiskey you know, guys like Paul Picault, who is the spirits writer for, I think, Wine Spectator or something like that. He said that was the best spirit in the world. Like cognacs, rums, all, you know, distilled spirits. He said that was the best spirit in the world. And that was 10 years ago. And it's definitely not the same. Um, I hate bringing up, you know, the Panama hat fellow. Um, so I won't mention his name. But like, even he's criticized them, you know, and in this case, I agree with them, which is kind of hard to admit um, that for the last eight to 10 years, it's been a sad shell of what it used to be. Um, so, you know, is it still decent? Yes. But I mean, I think it's disappointing if you were big into Highland Park, you know, 10, 15 years ago, like I was. Um, but uh, I, I honestly think this is, although at a higher proof, this is closer to what it used to be, maybe not quite as dark as it was, but this is more of that style that it used to be. Anyway. Um, oh yeah, Chris had a good joke here, which I don't entirely agree with, but it's timely since we had a referendum in the province recently. Um, Chris is saying we need whiskey equalization payments. Um, I, I'd say some of the other provinces might feel like they need them because of how much their governments want. Um, so we we won't open up that ball of wax, but uh, yeah, um, that's still pretty funny, Chris. So kudos to you for that. Um, okay, we're going to fire up a poll because Chelsea made it. The whiskeys are not necessarily in the order we sampled them, so you're going to have to to read clearly, but you're going to get a chance to vote for both your favorite and your second favorite whiskey. So we'll fire that up now. Um Hopefully you guys can see it. So obviously the Daft Mills, not where it was and whatnot, but just pick your favorite. What was your favorite whiskey? And then you'll notice you can scroll down. There's a second poll. You can pick your second favorite whiskey. So we'll keep that open for three or four minutes. Uh, give you time to do it. Kurt, should we go back around the horn? We've done this before, but go yeah. back around and see how they're, do a little check-in, see how they're doing since we, we went past them first. Um, back to the menagerie still stands up oh, still man. pretty still fruity still elegant i think uh i think it even shows better than first time around to be honest those fruit tones are beautiful yeah well and it i think you know it it shows two things one the whole concept behind blending is that you can make something that's greater than any of the individual parts and when you you do that well, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there to create something great. And the, I, I suppose one of the things that is that 
with certain whiskeys, Compass Box releases that uh, is of benefit to them is that they're not always trying to recreate the same thing. Now, granted, they have some core skews that they're trying to, to keep as consistent as possible, but with their one-offs, they can just take artistic license to, to have fun with it and to do something different. And that's probably quite liberating. You know, Johnny Walker Blue Label is trying to be the same all the time, even though it's not. Um, and maybe if they just had, you know, Johnny Walker Blue Label annual releases where they admitted it was never going to be perfectly the same, but they tried to make just a great whiskey, maybe it would be better. I mean, that's another taste. And Kurt, we can talk back to when was that last year we did the Johnny Walker, the little gift pack with everything up to the blue label. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember, but like the blue label was so disappointing. And I even had low expectations for it because I wasn't expecting it to be great. And it was even less impressive. When your low expectations are not only met, but exceeded. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the, whereas the gold and I think the platinum, I thought were both were both pretty good. And the black label was just, you know, no brainer. Um, okay. On to number two. <laughs> oh, there was a second thing I was going to say about the blends. It's just how good a blender compass box is. That was the other point I wanted to make. That, that whiskey just shows like how good they are at creating okay. fun things that really stand up. Um, Daphne, 2009. Recap thoughts. I'm getting root beer all over the nose on this one now. <laughs> it's the Kensington okay. Wine Market aroma. We get root beer and cheese and chopped cheese suggest. and everything. <laughs> yeah, I know this isn't where you were getting it before, but just nosing the glass now, it's kind of like mm -hmm. bark the root beer. The palate is so cheesy though now. It's uh, it's like aged Gouda. And it's, it's Gouda that, you know, was that a really what? bad dad joke? <laughs> it, was, it was. Well, you know, I'm a dad. I'm allowed to make dad jokes. That was a stinker. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. Okay, back to the Tormor. Second time through the Tormor. Hopefully yeah, most of you good. left a little drop in there so you can go back and revisit them. It's a little shy on the nose now. You know, I, I wonder if we maybe put this too far in, like, because we, yeah. we were wrestling with that one at the start. We did have it positioned first and then backed it up, but it has softened a lot. I think it might have shown better first. The, the nose doesn't do it justice right now, but the palate is still bang on. Um, it's fruity, it's malty, um, very pretty, very fresh. What about McCallan 18? Do we still like it? Do, do we dare say we love it? I really like that nose. There's some, there's some licorice all sorts coming through now too. Mm -hmm. still those jammy fruits there's a little bit of floral note coming now that i didn't really pick up on at first mm -hmm. but that's that's cool yeah. um it's still drinking really well as a whiskey i love it i do not love the price but what are you going to do um as cam said Shame about the price. The McCallum sitting in the spot, but shame about the price. Um, all right. Arden, Arden American, the most fun-loving, boisterous whiskey of tonight's lineup. This is rambunctious, I'd say. It's This is the class clown, if you think <laughs> about it. I mean, it it's standing out. It's, it's peacocking. Maybe it's not the most clever whiskey in the room. I'm... It's making his presence felt. You're going to hear me using that at work now when I'm talking to people about it. Yeah. Well, you know what it's kind of making me think of, although he is actually very clever, is my middle nephew, Magnus. This is making me think of Magnus because it's just, it's mischievous. Like there's something about the whiskey that's just mischievous and playful and fun. It's viscous. It's like, it's got way more texture than the others. Yeah. I can almost feel it gritting on my teeth. Like, wow. Yeah. Peacocking whiskey. Harvey's Muse. At the very least, something has been achieved there. Um, yeah. It. I mean, again, agreed. It needs some time. But I think this is just a fine example of well-made whiskey. Um, all right. Blended malt. Blended malt, Glen Scotia. Possibly, maybe, probably. Very ashy now. And grapey. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, those fruits are awesome. I love this whiskey so much. Yeah. The palate, the palate is pretty damn old school. And I think I can say this now, knowing that most people have expunged their votes, so I'm not influencing them. I think that's my favorite whiskey in the lineup tonight. Unquestionably. The question is, what is my second favorite? We'll answer that and all other questions momentarily. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to close the poll. One of you hasn't voted, but too late. Um, so favorite whiskey tonight. I'm going to share the results with you here. Um, the favorite whiskey tonight was the Berries Blended Malt. And check that out. Arden American Paul Lenoir is the second favorite whiskey of the night that is really cool it was not my second favorite although it gets special honors because it was the most fun whiskey of the night um barry's tormor showing really well there too everything but the orkney getting a vote which is kind of sad because i don't think the orkney was the least of our whiskeys tonight but nevertheless the people have spoken and second favorite look at that it's almost mm. almost a tie right across the board, but the blended malt is number one favorite and number two favorite of the night. And the Arden American is effectively number two and number two of the night. So, so very interesting favorite, results. Could we say it came ahead by a nose? <laughs> it was ahead by a nose. <laughs> a very good, Kurt, very good. We'll give you props don't to that me. one. Um, don't, I didn't deserve it. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> hey, look, that, that was as good as my joke about Gouda. I, that's or, my point. It was or slightly better. or slightly better or worse. I'm not really sure. Um, anyway, those are the results. So um, thank you to you guys for voting. Kurt, I have to ask. Yeah. What was what was what were your favorites tonight? The berries blended for sure. Um, yeah. I again, the sample didn't wow me. Like as soon as we cracked that bottle in the shop, I was absolutely enamored with it. Um, and every taste I've had since has been better. And this was my favorite taste that I've had so far, especially mm -hmm. having done the lineup and then come back around to it. Um, I, I adore that whiskey. And, and then it still second, stands up. It does. Yeah, absolutely. And then second to me, I probably hinted at it earlier. I think it's better even the second time around. It had to be Menagerie. For me. Yeah. I think it's in interesting, Kurt, because yeah. I, I would consider myself to be much more of a compass box fanboy than you are. Yeah. And I, I actually think the Macallan 18 was my second favorite. I'm kind of, oh. I feel a little dirty saying that. But, um, yeah, I, I just think it was good sherry and well-made. And that's not a, not taking the price into account. Um, Do you feel like you just run back to an ex that you know why you left her in the first place? You shouldn't be going back, but you're doing it anyway. You know, maybe part of me hopes Dan's watching this and he forgives me for whatever it is. I don't you know. Ah, uh, Dan Volway. Anyway, hope he's well. He good, is well. good, good dude. He's he's a good dude. But yeah, the Compass Box Menagerie was very good, um, and it definitely stands out in the range as being probably the most elegant of them. But yeah, Barry's blended malt for me, and I think I damn I hate to admit it, but. I really like the McAllen 18. Like it's just very, very well put together. So damn. Um, so now's the point in the evening when we stop the Facebook feed, which I just remembered, you know, I said I was going to address people's comments on there and it turns out I completely forgot about them for, for quite a while, but uh, J Renee Jacobs saying the cask Orkney 18 was good as well. And the double single from compass box, that was one of his favorites. So thanks for that, Jacob or Renee rather, uh, for sharing those comments. And uh, anyway, we're going to say goodbye to the Facebook folk. We're not going to kill the feed just yet. Um, we are also going to kill the recording. Um, I almost did what I did last time, which is I almost hit the end button, which just ends the tasting for everybody. And when we did do that by accident last week or the week before, we did actually go back on and a handful of you joined us. But uh, um, I'm going to kill the recording, not the tasting. Yes, I want to stop. I am going to end the Facebook feed. So good night to everybody on Facebook.